Ayla, you go from Christian conservative family to only fan star and sex worker. How does that happen? So I worked at a factory for uh, a year. Uh, and then I was like, wow, this really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than like a life spent working at the factory. That was really awful. You think sex work is less bad than working in a factory? I mean, it depends on the person. But for me and a lot of girls that I know who are in sex work, it was very, absolutely. How do you be seductive? If I lower my voice and talk slower, and I don't use big words, and I smile, make eye contact. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but... I'm, glad to, I'm glad that we're that predictable. Every <laughs> single one of us. You must enjoy escorting. Yep. Clearly, <laughs> right? Which I was surprised to find, yeah. <laughs> Ayla, you go from Christian conservative family to only fan star and sex worker. How does that happen? Uh, a long series of baby steps. Okay, uh, tell us. <laughs> well, like when you're raised in a Christian conservative home, they kind of don't prepare you for the real world, at least not the way that mine worked. So like homeschooled, expected to be a housewife kind of deal. Um, so I got in the real world and my realistically my options um, were not great. So I worked at a factory for uh, a year. Uh, and I was like, wow, this really sucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't have an education and I'm really like culturally isolated from the world. Uh, like it was really hard to like get along and understand what was going on because you know we weren't allowed to watch a lot of normal media, um, and so I had a friend who suggested trying camming because it was he did camming, and then I was like really poor sleeping on a friend's couch. I was like, you know what? I'll give it a shot and made a lot of money the first night, uh, and then one thing led to another, <laughs> and I just like like oh this is the the way to like uh, have many an agency um, when there was no other option for me. Mm. So. Well, I'm guessing by this point you would have had some kind of ideological shift as well because not many Christian conservatives would be like, I'm working in a factory, it sucks, <laughs> let's try camming. <laughs> it's quite a transition in terms of culture and all of that, right? Yeah, very much. I lost my faith maybe like a year or so after I left home, um, which was like a pretty rapid shift. I think like the exposure to being in a non-Christian world really helped me be able to think that maybe Christianity was false. Like, I think it's very difficult to actually consider that everything that you believe is wrong when every part of your culture is enmeshed with this. Like, every, you don't know anyone who disagrees. Like, I didn't know any non-Christians in my personal life. Uh, so it's just like your brain just to some degree can't, literally cannot consider this as an option. Um, or at least it's quite hard. It was quite hard for me. And so I think after I finally left home and I was like briefly attempted to do college, um, I was surrounded by people who weren't Christian and... They were living life and being happy and fine, and it was okay mm -hmm. somehow. And then this somehow let allowed some part of my subconscious to be like, maybe this is all false. Is there any part of, so, because you talk about leaving Christianity, is there any part of religion that you miss? Because there's a lot of people who say, you know what? It gives me a lot of structure. It gives me purpose. It gives me direction. Yeah, absolutely. It's like something that a lot of people have tried to replicate outside of religion, and it's really hard to do for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there's like the there's an intense community. You just have like a pre-built community that trusts each other. Uh, like a lot of help. Like, for example, my family moved from California to Idaho when I was quite young. And they just had like a church in Idaho, mm -hmm. like send out all of their people to help us unload, move in and out of like various apartments for free for no reason. It was just like because you're part of the community, you get you're part of the in-group. You get this kind of help. And that's super cool. I mean, it is, and particularly nowadays where people are struggling for community. I mean, did you find that difficult, the, the loss of a community, the loss of structure? A bit. I found community in other cam girls at the time, so that helped a lot. And then I found rationalists, which uh, in a lot of ways actually operate kind of similar to churches. So The fly finds you very attractive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's, they can't stay away. It's into you. Yeah. It's into you. It's one of your fans. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you start camming. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what's that like? Great. It was scary the first night, but after that it kind of got fine. And I was pretty awkward. Like a lot of uh, instruction about how to be flirty and seductive as a woman, like the general 
uh, like you watch movies, like teen movies about how you flirt and what kind of things mean what. I didn't really have any of that. Like to the degree where I remember my first time at a bar, somebody walked up to me and offered me like, can I buy you a drink? And I was like, sure. And they bought me a drink and I just took it and I walked away. <laughs> I didn't understand that that was a, like a cultural indication of interest. Yeah. And to yeah. me, it was literally, I want to give you money to, for alcohol. And I'm like, that is a nice stranger. So it's like this level of not understanding. You're very literal, work. Ayla. Very literal. Literal, yeah. <laughs> Like someone comes up to you, gives you a drink, you're like, thank you, and just walk away. That guy must have been devastated. Yeah, I know. I feel really bad looking in hindsight. It's like, oh, he probably thinks women are bitches, but no, I'm just um, either autistic or homeschooled or both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> unclear. Um, but yeah, so I, I really did not have a lot of the uh, organic understanding of what it's like to be a seductive woman, like how you're supposed to signal us. Um, and so a lot of my early years camming was um, very goofy. Uh, I just was very funny. I was a mime, a sex mime, um, and I would do just wacky stuff all the time before eventually figuring out that that's not the best way to make money. Mm. <laughs> so how it's interesting. It sounds to me like you've had to almost kind of mechanically work out how to do certain things that you didn't get from your upbringing or whatever, and one of them is being seductive. Mm -hmm. How do you be seductive? Well, it's a multi-step process. So what I'm doing right now, this is not seductive. If I were like trying to like eke you for all the money you had, there's no way that this would work. Um, but if I like, if I like adjust my posture slightly, um, and if I lower my voice and talk slower, and I don't use big words, and I smile, make eye contact, and really drop like my sphere of energy into my lower stomach. Um, it does a lot better. Yeah, uh, yeah. But... I'm glad. To, I'm glad that we're that predictable. Every <laughs> single one of us. That that, um, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, logically, <laughs> logically, that makes but, sense. But it took me so long to figure that out. Like when I was camming, I had a, a paper with like rules for myself. So with camming, it's very rapid feedback. You mm. get like live people coming in. You see the numbers of your room rise and fall depending on what you're doing. You see your money per hour averaged over the last sixty days is shown as a score. This is my free cams. Mm. So you get like very rapid instruction about the kinds of behaviors you're doing that work or not. Um, so I, ha I had a paper behind my webcam, which is the rules I eventually figured out, which was smile mm -hmm. always, uh, keep eye contact with the camera, talk really slowly, way slower than you think you need to, and use simple language. Just, And that, when I did that, my money increased quite a lot. Why do you think you have to use simple language? I, it's like, I, I think it's, there's like a couple theories, some of them flattering and some of them not. Like one of them is like, if you're very horny, you're probably not thinking in like higher brained language. You're probably just, which is kind yeah. of true, right? Ugh. Which is legitimate. So if you yeah. if you want to give like a really intentional signal that you are aroused, you know, you probably shouldn't be using multi-syllabic language or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but another one is that like, you don't want to appear too intimidating. Like you want to be accessible. This is like one of the biggest rules for seduction is you want to be as accessible as possible mm -hmm. and as reactive as possible. And if you're using like big language, maybe it's subtly signaling to the men that like, oh, I'm going to have to try harder to have an impact on her in the way that I want. And Ayla, was this OnlyFans or was this a platform before OnlyFans when you started? This is my free cams, which is actually owned by the person who bought OnlyFans. Before okay, I got and this big. was, it, what, what, what year was this? Uh, this is this was when I was like twenty one tw or twenty years old to twenty five or twenty six. Cool. So that was how long ago now? Just and I'm thirty one. <laughs> okay. All right. So because I'm just trying to work out at what point of the internet because now apparently OnlyFans is super competitive. Yeah, super competitive. So when you started, that was was it like a gold rush era for camming? Uh, no, camming had been around uh, like maybe five, 10 years earlier before I started. Um, it, it was it was sort of the golden era, but it wasn't like a spike in the way that we see this happen to OnlyFans. With OnlyFans, yeah. it like came in and it changed the world. And with like my free cams and related campsites, it was like a slow climb over you know the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, you say changed the world. How did OnlyFans change the world? It's just radically changed the internet. Like. I, I'm a big internet person. I feel like internet is my culture. I grew mm -hmm. up on the internet. I love the internet. And uh, the introduction of OnlyFans like modified rules across the internet in order to handle OnlyFans. Like uh, one of the things that I'm not sure if OnlyFans did intentionally, but might be genius, is that they don't have internal discovery. 
um, which is like, for example, what my free camps had and every other public sex site, as far as I can tell, had internal discovery. That's like the value that it's giving. But the OnlyFans, if you internal sign Internal discovery is when you can be found on the platform right. by accident or by being recommended. Is that what internal... Yeah, by like re recommendation. Like YouTube, right? You yeah. watch a video, you get a bunch of suggestions. That's what you're talking about. Right, yeah. So if you put a video on YouTube, you expect YouTube to provide the viewers to your video. Yes. You don't have to go out and like post on Twitter and be like, hey guys, come see my video. Yes. Um, so with OnlyFans, they have no internal discovery, which means that if I'm a girl on OnlyFans and I want subscribers, what do I have to do? I have to go out to other websites and post my link and try and convince people to come subscribe to me. Um, and this is just... Every user on OnlyFans that makes any money has to do this, which means that we saw like a rapid influx of any place on the internet that allowed not safe for work posting just became completely dominated by OnlyFans. And they had to change the rules to handle that. And why wouldn't you use your own website to do that? Where do you get the traffic for that website? But you are having to bring the traffic to OnlyFans. Yes. Yeah, so you, Reddit, for example, is a great thing or TikTok or Instagram, mm. those things will promote your video to other people. Those have internal discovery. So you post something that like is a sexy video to one of these platforms and then people see it and then you have a funnel and then you, they go find your OnlyFans. I know, but what I'm saying is why would you not just use your own website instead of OnlyFans? Oh, it's, well, it's very hard. I, so I did look into this. So I, I misunderstood what you were saying um, because like OnlyFans takes 20% and you're like, maybe I That's can what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Right. right, but uh, payment processors are terrible. If you want to use payment processors to accept funds for what you're building um, and you're selling not safe for work stuff, the fees are massive. And I think it's my understanding that OnlyFans, because they're doing such huge volume, managed to negotiate some sort of like lower fees mm -hmm. for those payment processors. But if you're doing it as an individual, you have no bargaining power. I um, and I looked into it and it was just, you can't, I wouldn't be able to, I would be losing 20% easily. And just for the cost of setting up the website, it's just not worth it. And I mean, OnlyFans is one of those things that became super successful over the pandemic. Like, I mean, do you know how much is turnover now at OnlyFans? How much money are they making? They must be making- I don't know, massive still. Because it just seems that it just hit the zeitgeist, whereas before I'd never even been aware of it. Yeah, it was around for years beforehand. It started in 2017, I think. I think that's mm -hmm. what I joined. I, I remember joining OnlyFans and nobody was on it. Nobody had heard of it. And I like posted some things and made like 40 bucks and then yeah. never signed on again. Um, so it's really weird. And why do you think, I mean, uh, not to state the obvious too much, but there's a lot of porn on the internet. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> um, why do you think the camming thing is taken off in the way that it has, as opposed to watching, you know, a recorded video produced by a porn studio or whatever. I, mean, I think there's a subset of men for which it's very interesting. Like a lots of guys like don't care about the thing where you pay for an interaction, but we have examples like strip clubs throughout history mm -hmm. are really nice. You go and the girl, you know, makes you feel special for a little while. I think that's a big part of why OnlyFans and camming are successful. It's because, like, despite the stereotypes for a lot of men, uh, like, sex is not completely separable from uh, romantic interaction. Like, it's very much about validation. Like, guys, like, when I was an escort, um, about 80%, I would say, roughly, of men really wanted to make sure I had a good time. Uh, even though they didn't have to, they were paying me a ridiculous amount of money for me to do whatever they wanted, and they spent that time trying to please me. And so I think like what guys are really want is like for a woman to sort of like gaze upon him sexually and be like, yes, you are valuable. I am sexually aroused by you. Uh, I affirm you as a sexual being. Um, and that's some, not something that porn can do. Um, who's the type of person that uses OnlyFans? Is it all male? Is it male and female? Do, does it have like a component where a couple will watch a cam girl together? Occasionally, but it's quite low. I haven't actually like tracked stats for this, but it, off the top of my head, I'd say 99% male. Yeah. Every once in a while, I get like a couple being like, hey, we watched you together. And then even rarer than that, I get like a lady who's like, mm. I'm gay and I'm really into you. But it's almost entirely men. It's almost entirely men. I mean, look, that, that, does, make a lot, <laughs> that <laughs> does make a lot of sense. And, and when did you know that you were onto something, that you could, that you could make this really work for you? For OnlyFans? Yeah. Pretty fast. The thing is, like, I I just happened to already be in a position for OnlyFans to work for me. I've been doing sex work for a long time, um, but I'm not very, uh, I'm not, like, a top 10 at char charisma skill in person. So mm. if I'm doing a thing where I have to seduce a lot of men by acting like this, like, it's it's quite, I have to figure it out top down. Yeah. A lot of girls are able to emanate this bottom up. But with OnlyFans, the strength is not in being charismatic. The strength is in knowing how to market. 
how to uh, how, like how to market to men, how to do funnels, how to like track conversion. Like most of my job with OnlyFans was not posting to OnlyFans. It was like eighty percent sitting behind spreadsheets um, when I was doing it full time. <laughs> Doesn't sound that sexy when you when you say it like that. It's not. <laughs> um, and I'm curious. I mean, obviously, the the one thing we haven't talked about, and this isn't going to be news to you, but um, doing sex work online exposes you to a lot of people, and with that come certain risks. So here you are. You have a factory job. You tried this camming for for a night. You make more money than you make at the factory. Um, did you at that point think, well, like this is not this has got some serious trade-offs, let's put it like that. I mean, in contrast to the factory, like, uh, I mean, I was vaguely aware of them, but like my current life was so bad, I was willing to take them. And in hindsight, it was still worth it. But for a long time, it wasn't that bad because I wasn't super well known. Mm. Um, and it's been getting worse recently. But it, it does, there are downsides. Like I'm not saying that like every girl should just go try sex work. If you're desperate, it's probably better for you because like even with the downsides, it's better than like a life spent working at the factory that was really awful. Um, but Do you think sex work is less bad than working in a factory? I mean, it depends on the person. People have different constitutions yeah. Yeah. and tolerance for things. Yeah. Like I'm not universally recommending it. But for me and a lot of girls that I know who are in sex work, it was very, absolutely. They're like, I can't believe that people are so, people, I, this happens all the time. I'm like, oh, I'm in sex work. And people are like, oh, are you okay? Like, are you worried about the downsides, you know? And I'm like, nobody ever said that to me when I worked at the factory, which was way worse for my mental health. I was like drinking to cope. And that's like a classic sign of like, oh, this is really hard for you. But I never had a drink to cope with being a sex worker. But I think the thing that people think when they see sex works, one of the downsides, shall we say, is a reputational damage, Ayla. Yeah, but definitely. Particularly for a woman. Yeah. You know, if you then want to move on and you want to leave, because there's going to be a time, I assume, that you're going to want to leave this behind. I don't know if you want to start a family, if you want to get married, all of those things. And you go, that's something you can never truly leave behind, is it? Uh, absolutely. Although I suspect that when most people are evaluating this, they're like not aware of how different, different cultures can be. Mm. Like, I think the thing that you're describing would be true for a P pretty large majority of American culture and probably in general yeah. Western culture and especially non-Western culture. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to keep going. Yeah, can't imagine it would go down well in Saudi Arabia. No. <laughs> Although I'm sure there's plenty of consumers from Saudi yeah. Arabia, but anyway, carry on. Yeah, yeah. but this is this has never, legitimately never been a problem in my life because I'm polyamorous and there's just like a whole subculture, thriving subculture of people who are pretty sexually open and don't mind it. Like in my friend groups, in like especially in the Bay when I live there, so people don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. um, like I'll go up and I'll say, like, "Hey, I'm a sex worker on dates," and the guy will be like, "Oh yeah, my, my ex girlfriend was a sex worker too. She that was she really liked it." Like it's a very common conversation. It's just not a thing that registers as an issue. Really, like you know, I've always thought I'm very liberal. Maybe I'm just old and conservative because I can't get my look. I I can't get my head around polyamory. Please explain it to me. Like, what are the benefits? Like, to me, it just looks like needless admin, complications, frustrations. Is it? Is it? Is, what, 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 just explain it to me, please. I, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you're you're not wrong, but the full story I think is a little bit more nuanced. Yeah. Like, I did a study where I measured, I think, thirty thousand people. I asked them about their relationship. Mm -hmm. Had them do a survey. I asked them how polyamorous, how monogamous are you on a scale from like one to seven. Um, and then I asked them a whole bunch of questions about the quality of their relationship, how much sex, how long have you been in this relationship? Mm -hmm. And uh, people who are fully monogamous and fully polyamorous had roughly the same relationship quality. They've been in relationships for the same amount of time, so it's not like people who are poly are breaking up more. Um, and they were like, yeah, it's still going strong. Um, but people in the middle had much worse ratings. Um, and the problem is, if you're going to be selecting from a poly population, most people who aren't monogamous are only slightly not monogamous. They're like a little bit poly. The majority of all people who are not monogamous are in the middle. Um, so if you're just selecting randomly for the non-monogamous non population, it's going to look pretty bad. What does slightly poly mean? Um, usually a married couple opens their relationship, uh, but they still, they date together. Or married couple opens their relationship, but like the person isn't having a full-time relationship, it's just sex. Like that's an example. So uh, the question I guess I want to ask is how do you divorce sex from feelings or are these people who by their nature or biologically able to do that very easily? Yeah, my guess to some degree it's innate and genetic. A lot of poly people I know, myself included, like don't really process jealousy the same way. 
Like I remember before I had heard of polyamory, I was trying to date this guy when I was a teenager and he went and he was like, I caught him sexting with another girl. And I was like, grr, don't do that. Yeah. Like, but I remember not really, I was like, I couldn't summon the genuine anger. Cause I'm like, what does this have to do with me? Like he still wants to have sex with me, still loves me. Like, I don't understand why this is hurting me in any way. Um, and then as soon as I heard about polyamory, I was like, oh yeah. So my guess is if you're thinking of this closer to like almost a sexual orientation, mm -hmm. I think that this, I'm not necessarily accurate, but I think this explains a lot closer to what's going on. Like people are just processing relationships differently. And if you have a whole bunch of those people in a culture, it goes pretty well. But the problem is you have to be quite dedicated for it to seem to go well, at least in my data. Um, I think a lot of people are doing the partial thing as a way to sort of solve problems that exist in previous relationships. Like if you have an monogamous pe people going, oh, we're going to try, you know, opening it up because like we're having these issues. I'm like, you're opening it up to solve issues. It's not going to solve your relationship. Like it's now you're just going to be poly issues. with a terrible yeah. relationship. Yeah. And, and it's also as well, I think, you know, there's an element of fashion to it where kind of no one wants to be like a straight white dude anymore. Like everybody like wants to be, you know, something fluid or... You know, poly is, is something else, but I just don't think many people are compatible with it. I think most people would really struggle to see their girlfriend go off and get, you know, have sex with another dude. I, I think to some degree you're right, but there is a thing where, so one, most people kind of aren't monogamous. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you want your, you don't want your partner to go fuck other people, but you want to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like the cheating rates in long-term relationships are really high. Like if you measure cheating rates by the amount of time you've been in the relationship and not by age, which is m what most cheating rates do, it's, it seems to be much higher, like 40, 45 percent. Yeah. Um, it's really d depressing. So most people by action in a world where we horribly punish cheating are still cheating at really high rates, which makes me think that we're not inherently monogamous in the way that we would like aspire yeah. to be. Uh, this doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Uh, well, monogamy, people would argue, I mean, Louise Perry, who you've done a debate with, who's, who, who's a friend of ours, uh, she would argue monogamy is an adaptation for stabilizing society that works very well to do that. Uh, I think this is probably true at some points in history. Do you not think it's true now? Uh, my guess is that it is not sustainably true now. Um, or rather that like there are a lot of things which are good if you only have the capacity to process like simple nuance. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it's probably uh, if you have, let's see, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, if you have uh, somebody who like abused their wife, we pr it's probably good as a social construct to just like punish that person. But if we have the capacity as a society to make nuance between, did you do it like because you had a brain tumor um, and we removed the brain tumor, you no longer feel violent urges, uh, then I would say it would be good to make this nuanced distinction. And so like, I think that a lot of these rules are sort of good for more simplistic versions of society where just culturally we don't have the ability at scale mm -hmm. to determine nuance. But I feel like we're kind of hitting the point in culture where we are able to. And I'm like, the reality is if we are going to look at the nuance, like monogamy is like stable in some ways, but there's lots of versions of non-monogamy that have been stable throughout history. And a lot of people are deeply unhappy in it. And is there a way that we can figure out to move forward where we are not crushing people's souls? Like if you look at satisfaction rates, happiness rates in really long-term monogamous relationships, they're really low. And to be fair, they're not great in polyamory either, but I'm saying like whatever we're doing, like whatever conception we're having about relationships, like I, I believe that we can figure out a way to move forward and to like figure out how to raise happiness. And it's probably not going to look like the thing it used to look like. No, uh, that, and it's an interesting point. I suppose the one thing is that what you're talking about is essentially you're saying there is room for subcultures to exist within society where people can go and live in the way that's suitable for them. The bit that that leaves out is the raising of children mm -hmm. because you may be poly and you will be with, I suppose, several people over the course of your lifetime. If you were to have kids, you don't know if you've got a genetically poly predisposed kid and they're being raised in that culture, just kind of like you were raised as a, in, a, in a Christian conservative culture and you had to go and find a different one, right? Um, so it complicates the raising of children because norms that exist, they exclude minority people, but they also give the majority a structure for how to live life that with, without which people will be lost quite a lot of the time. Yeah. Would that be fair to say? Uh, I think that this is true, but like you could argue, should we not have gay people raising kids? And some people do argue this, but they are a minority raising children. And we generally seem to be okay with this. Um, 
And secondarily, like my guess is that probably more people are interested in some degree of the poly spectrum than we think. Like we have such, like, can you remember the last uh, romantic movie you saw that was polyamorous? No. Yeah, they don't exist. We just don't have monogamy. Uh, Give it a couple of years. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon we're going to see one soon. I would hope so. Yeah. The thing is, like, we have like a lot of like gay cinema, but we have nothing for polyamory at all. Mm -hmm. And we have like a whole culture that's structured to show monogamous people like how to live. This is the, these are the subtle social rules for how to communicate with each other in a monogamous setting, which I think is great. Like, it really helps it run a lot smoother. And if you and my guess is if we had some instructions, like some cultural media instructions for like, how does poly relationships work? How do you handle jealousy? Because uh, we just don't know this. And I think it would make it go a lot smoother. And I think probably a lot more people would feel comfortable trying a poly lifestyle in a way that actually ends up being successful. Um, but that is slightly besides your point. Uh, personally, so I think it is true. It does seem that poly people raise a lot fewer children. In my data, they have kids at around half the rate of people who reported being monogamous, even controlling for age and relationship length, um, which is not great. But I know a lot of people, poly people who do raise kids successfully, so. We're gonna be at the Battle of Ideas on the 28th and the 29th of October in London. The Battle of Ideas is a festival of free speech that happens in London every year where you will see some of your favorite guests from trigonometry coming to London to take part in debates. Not only that, both Francis and I will be there. I'll be taking part in the Spike podcast and also in a discussion about online censorship. And I'll be there talking about Mizzy, from misery to online civility. I think that's the name of it. Basically, we're gonna be talking about Mizzy and what a horrible little so-and-so he is. Yeah, come along, uh, not just for that, but also because there'll be lots of cool people there. Make sure to say hello to us if you see us. Grab your tickets today by going to the Battle of Ideas website. And if you want a 20% discount, it's available to all our supporters on Locals. So if you're not already there, head on over, subscribe, get your 20% off. And Ella, do you think that this rise of poly and, and you know these other kind of lifestyles, shall we call them, or ways of living, do you think it's because we're viewing sex more and more as a, as a form of recreation rather than, in the biblical sense, where it was procreation? I guess, which, I mean, comes from probably birth control, right? Mm. Like, if you're yeah. not, we no longer have, like, a God's eternal punishment for having sex. <laughs> I have sex know. without the punishment. That's a very, very <laughs> particular way of describing <laughs> children, yeah. <laughs> you, you met my son earlier. I don't consider him God's punishment yeah. for sex, I have to say. I think, I'm thinking of, like, whorehouses back in the day without birth sure. control, where yeah. all these children are running of around. Course. You don't have the, like, societal capacity to care for them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is what I mean by Children are lovely. I would like to have kids. Mm -hmm. um, but in this, in this sense, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's divorced because of birth control. Yeah, um, the, it, that, that's an interesting point. Uh, what I was going to ask you about coming back to sex work is one of the things I, I, I read or watched you say, which I found very interesting, was um, camming and OnlyFans, you said, was quite unhealthy in terms of your, your, men, your well-being, but being an escort was much better. Yeah, very much. I think that is incredibly counterintuitive to a lot of people. <laughs> Because I suppose because of the attachments they have to what sex means, they I suppose they would see it as unwanted sex. And therefore, if you can at least not have it with another person, then it's good. But you clearly have a completely different experience of it. Well, we have norms where people are expected to have unwanted sex all the time in long-term monogamous marriages. And I, like, I wouldn't argue that's necessarily bad. Like, maybe to some degree there's a duty where um, you, as a wife you should keep your husband satisfied because if he can only get sex from one place and typically it's the man wanting sex from the woman, although it's not always. So I don't know, like the concept of like having to have sex that you're just like not that into is like, sure, people do this. People have been doing this for all of human history, man. It's like, but And yeah. by people you mean women. <laughs> mostly <laughs> mostly yeah. yeah but i was also really surprised to find this with the sex work thing too like mm. uh it was after i did escorting and i went back to OnlyFans, and i was like it just feels dehumanizing like in both ways i feel like i'm dehumanizing my customers and my customers are dehumanizing me mm. when i'm online but in person like to, to the degree that i can safely and comfortably feel love for my client i allow myself to do so I really like feeling like a part of me really cares about them in that moment. And that's a thing that I just can't experience with OnlyFans. Because it's somebody on the other side of a text box and you're communicating often asynchronously. Um, but like 
in person, you get to like have that one-on-one -on -one thing. Like my entire being right now is like having a genuine connection with another individual. And then that you can like touch souls a little bit. And I love every, like that this happened for every client that I've had in the past. That just not not so much with OnlyFans. It's interesting. I have a couple of questions about that. But the first one is I think what you're describing, oddly enough, and I didn't expect this to come up in a, in a conversation with a sex worker, is actually the, the human paradigm in the 21st century, which is we're all connecting in ways that are fake through avatars. Mm -hmm. And actually, we all crave a real human connection in meat space. Yeah. And I found it made me feel better, too. Yeah. Really? So the question that I was going to ask, though, is, and this is com coming from a normie place, so I hope it doesn't sound judgmental or whatever, but, but I think a lot of people will want to know this, is like, you can't be attracted to every guy that wants to pay you money to have sex with you, right? No. That's not possible, <laughs> no. I'm guessing, right? Yeah, well, I'm not attracted to most men. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you for making that clear. <laughs> clear. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean, though? It's like you talk about having that connection and almost feeling a love for somebody that you're not even attracted to. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? I can't tell how much I'm a normal woman or a weird woman when it comes to sexual response. Um, but uh, I just, like, for, my vagina just responds with lubrication when there's a new penis. It doesn't matter if I'm attracted to them or not. So it worked fine. Mm -hmm. But, like, to me, I'm not processing, like, is this guy hot? Like, to me, there's just, like, dude. It's like a generic, like, dude form. Uh, and I just, like, have sex. It's like giving them a massage. I don't know. It's like, do I have to be attracted to someone to give them a massage? It's like giving them a massage. Or like, yeah, or doing therapy. It's like, I don't have to find you hot to do therapy. On no, you. I get it. But but sex is different, surely. I'm, yeah, this is where I can't tell if I'm similar to most women or not. No, you're not similar <laughs> to most women. I can tell you that. But a lot of other sex workers I've talked to, it's like, I don't know. They yeah. just have well, sex. This is yeah. where we're getting to is like, I think there's probably a, a, a minority of women who are able to process sex in a very different way to the to, to other women don't have to call it normal, you could just call it the majority or whatever, where sex is a tool for creating long-term attachment to create security for the, re for the potential creation of life that then is protected and fed, etc., right? Mm -hmm. um, but... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an... Sorry for... Yeah, no, I was just going to say... Uh, do, so, <laughs> I mean... Okay, right. I guess the question I want to ask is... Isn't sex more than that, though? Yeah. It, isn't sex about connection, ultimately? Isn't it about, you know, trying to create a bond? And therefore, I mean, that's what I feel sex is. But if that is the case, then don't you catch feelings, as the kids would say, from your clients? Not really. I, not, like, it takes a lot more than sex for me to catch feelings. Like, I have to like the person. Like, we have to have a connection in ways that aren't just about sex. Uh, sex can help. But um, there's an example where, so I used to throw naked parties. And mm -hmm. people, before they would come, would be like, oh, God, this is going to be really weird. What if I get a boner? What if I'm staring at boobs the whole time? It was really nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. Then they would come and then often report, I'm actually shocked by how quickly my brain, like, recontextualizes nudity. I'm here and there's just a bunch of bodies and it's, like, somehow not sexual. Um, I didn't expect that this could happen because we've never been exposed to nudity in like wide non-sexual context before. And I think that there's something like this going on with sex. Like if you've only ever experienced sex in context where the narrative is that this is like a highly important connective thing, then that's what you're going to expect. But like weirdly, if you just kind of start experiencing sex in other contexts, it works there too. Like exposure to the naked parties didn't make nudity less sexy in other contexts. Mm -hmm. As I assume doctors still can get aroused fucking their wives even if they look at a bunch of vaginas. But it just expands the ways that sex can be meaningful to you instead of keeping it narrow. Okay, so the other question is the biggest threat to women is men. And have you ever worried that you were putting yourself as a woman in a vulnerable position? by doing this type of work. Definitely. Uh, it's like, oddly, like the internet stuff has turned out to be a little bit more threatening. Um, there's a guy who showed up at my house and tried to murder me last year, which was pretty scary. 
Um, I can imagine. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's awful. So, uh, and was it, I mean, obviously we don't want to go too much into detail because we don't want to give this person publicity, but was it former client, former, no idea. Complete rando. Never seen him before. He had never tried to contact me. The guy just showed up at my house dressed as an FBI officer and told me to get in the car. So I was under arrest, uh, which I believe him because <laughs> like, you don't expect but it turned out he had brought like a garrote and hunting knife and stuff. Wow. Um, and luckily I did not get in the car, but. You, yeah. And so, and but, and people tracked this person and they, obviously the police tracked this person Yeah, he's down. in jail. Yeah, and they have no idea how he came to discover who you are, why he believed these things or. Just random internet. But he, they found, um, they, they told me that they found the information of other sex workers in his house. Okay. So the, this is my, current theory is that he was just targeting sex workers, basically. Be because when I was doing research, you sound like you, you do very well out of this. Very, very well. I was reading like $100,000 a month, OnlyFans, $3,000 an hour for like a, a, a session or whatever it may be called. Um, You're coming across very comfortable in this Yeah, way. I know, mate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but I, I guess, do you, do you not feel like you put yourself in danger every time that you do this and I guess is that not a concern a worry that you especially if you don't need the money anymore yeah but I would rather like die being who I am than live trying to hide like if I could go over and be like you, you oh you're no longer at risk from murder but you like are not very open about who you are on the internet or you're trying to hide like mm. I would rather I'd rather take the scary road and uh, do you still do escorting mm -hmm. so I, I suppose the question is given that you as Francis says you do very well out of OnlyFans mm. you must enjoy escorting yep <laughs> clearly right which I was surprised to find yeah <laughs> yeah I think that's really the core of where I think a no normal, I don't use it in any judgmental sense, just like a, 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 a mainstream, whatever the fucking... I hate this world <laughs> where you can't just say what you mean. Yeah. I think the disconnect between a normal person and what you're saying is contained in that thing, which is you, you enjoy that. You enjoy that work. Uh, yeah. I, I, turns out that I like sex with new people. It's just really nice. Um, and it's difficult to do for me in that, like, I feel kind of awkward and confused about how to initiate sex with another person. Um, but if they're paying for it, then it's clear. Oh, you show up and it's the whole thing is laid out for you. So you kind of, you would be doing this anyway, but you're just getting paid for it. Is that what you're saying? Uh, to some degree. If I were doing this for free, which I do, well, I have a survey where people can apply to have sex with me, and then if they're like highly sexually compatible, then I contact them. <laughs> um, <laughs> You've really taken the admin side of this to the next level, yeah, haven't you? I don't think you like sex. I think you like admin. <laughs> I think I like spreadsheets. Yeah. I think what gets you off is Excel, let's be yeah, honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so you have the survey, and you have sex with some of the people who are highly compatible with you. What does highly compatible mean? If they're into the same weird kinks that I'm into. Okay, and this was gonna be my other question, which is I imagine the people who pay to have sex with the sex worker, they have an idea of how they want that to go. Yeah, generally it's quite vanilla. Really? Yes, super vanilla. They just, they pay money to have sex in the missionary position, basically. Uh, I mean, so I'm not saying that they don't have fetishes. I'm saying that in general, the way that escorting is structured is that you're not supposed to discuss uh, what you're into beforehand because for legal risk reasons. There's a lot of things about the fact that escorting is illegal that makes it like dangerous and hard. Um, like for example, I did get assaulted once when I was escorting, couldn't go to the police. Um, but that aside, uh, yeah, so you're not allowed to basically talk about sex acts in advance. And so it's quite hard for people to locate and negotiate people mm. who are open to various specific things. So I have met a lot of people um, who maybe have preferences for fetishes, but they tend to be kind of mild and they tend to be shy about asking for them. Mm. Ayla, we've had a uh, feminist on the show called Julie Bindle, who is a fantastic writer and thinker. And we both love Julie and both big fans. She has campaigned for a long time to make prostitution illegal and to criminalize the men who seek out prostitutes. What's the other side? Why should prostitution and escorting, why should it be legal? 
Yeah. If you talk to any active escort, uh, almost all of them will say that they would uh, disagree with making it illegal. <laughs> yeah. So, like, usually when people advocate that, I'm like, sounds like you have either not talked to escorts or you have talked to, like, a small percentage that left it and had a bad time. Um, but there's a whole bunch that are, this is your life's work. Um, and if you talk to us, you would find out that, man, I would like to uh, see men and then not get punished for it. And I would like to see men and not have them get punished for it. Um, the Nordic model is also pretty bad. Um, like the incentive structure is like, uh, one of the ways that you get treated better as an escort is if you're able to like charge more and basically have more bargaining power. Yeah. Um, if you increase supply and reduce demand, um, this makes it so that the supply side has less bargaining power, um, which means that you're more likely to take uh, safety risks in order to like and charge less money. Um, and in my data, uh, charging less money is correlated with higher rates of um, being offended against or like having bad things happen to you, like being assaulted. Um, so if you are uh, making it illegal for the men but not the women, you're going to have a higher supply of women and fewer men, um, which just basically makes the power imbalance pretty bad and makes it way more prone to having bad things happen. Uh, but yeah, I basically all, I'm not asking for much. I would just like to go to the police when someone assaults me. Mm -hmm. and not have them arrest me because I accepted money for something that a lot of other people do for free. Right. And the, the, I, I do find it upsetting, Ayla, I'm going to be honest with you, that you talk about being assaulted in such a casual manner. You know, it's... I. That's just a natural human response from me. I'm just being honest well, with you. I, it's, it's really not great. I agree. It's, it's um, unpleasant. I would rather have been assaulted than worked at the factory, to be clear. Mm. Like, the... But but also like the fact that I was assaulted could have been prevented if it were not illegal. If it, if prostitution was criminalized, the thing that got me into that place. Yeah. Because what happened is like if you can vet men properly beforehand, if you're able to have like more resources poured into excellent blacklists for women to share, which right now that you have to operate in the shadows because this is a aiding prostitution. So like if you if you de decriminalize prostitution and then women will have the tools to make themselves safer and it will dramatically re decrease the risk of assault. And is there any particular country that you know gets it right as far as you're concerned or does be is is better to the model that you would like to see? I don't know. I haven't talked to enough sex workers from those countries. Yeah. Which is the way that I would determine. I would go to the sex workers and be like how safe do you feel? How much do you feel like you're getting like your money taken away from you by like coercive brothels, for example. Okay. So I don't know. Do you have a website or do you plan to have a website? Because if you do, then EasyDNS is a company for you. EasyDNS is the perfect domain name registrar provider and web host for you. They have a track record of standing up for their clients, whether it be cancel culture, de-platform attacks, or overzealous government agencies. He knows about that. So will you in a second. <laughs> Easy DNS have rock solid network infrastructure and fantastic customer support. They're in your corner no matter what the world throws at you, unless it's your ex-girlfriend, in which case you're on your own. <laughs> you know about that. <laughs> Move your domains and websites over to Easy DNS right now. All you've got to do is go to easydns.com forward slash triggered. That's easydns.com forward slash triggered. Use our promo code, which is also triggered, and get 50% off the initial purchase. Sign up for their newsletter, Access of Easy, which tells you everything you need to know about technology, privacy, and censorship. We've talked about escorting. We've talked about OnlyFans. I mean, we kind of haven't talked about the porn, the porn industry, which is the making the movies, etc. Did that side of it ever appeal to you? And if not, why not? It didn't because you make a lot less money. Okay. For a lot less control. I think like the advent of like to some degree camming, but especially OnlyFans has just ripped the power away from from the like the centralized industries, which I think is kind of good. It's like the new media of porn, right? It's like YouTube taking over the TV. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I suppose, I, I, you know, I'm just curious asking all these questions from a normie perspective because I think a lot of people watching will have them. Um, the thing that I think a lot of people would say is that um, sex is, I mean, sacred makes me sound like a religious nut, but that's how a lot of people will feel about it, whether they're religious or not. Uh, they, a lot of people feel that sex has a meaning beyond 
the physical act. And Louise Perry, who, as I say, you've debated before, she gives this example of if we just treated sex like any other service, there would be absolutely no reason why it would be offensive for your boss, whose secretary you are, to say, well, if you give me a blowjob, I'll give you a raise, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's just like giving a massage, like you said. Like, why, why wouldn't... Do you see what I'm saying? Do we consider it offensive to be like, if you give me a massage, I'll give you a raise? Uh, only because there's a sexual dimension to it. If, if I said to my secretary, if you make my coffee on time every week and it's exactly the way that I want it, I'll give you a raise. Right. I mean, but I'm that's Jewish, within the so job description. That, but... Like if you were like, if you wash my car, I'll give you a raise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that starts to feel a little bit weirder and exploitative because it's outside the job description. Like, uh, I don't think we would Okay, are... if I have a PA and I say to her, him or her, in, in our case, it's him. Uh, can you go and take my car to the car wash? But you could argue that's within his job well, description. Let, let's pick something that is clearly not within the job description. Okay. Like, can you watch my kids? Like, yeah. in the yeah, same way as blowjob. Kids. Fine, isn't... watch my kids. Right, that would feel a little weird. As weird as having giving someone a blowjob? Uh, well, I think it's just like the, the sense of exploitation that we have. Like, oh, I have power over you and I will dangle money if you do something like personal for me. Okay, mm, yeah. but what I'm saying is something else, which is if I was to say to my PA, watch my kids for an hour and you get a raise, I don't think that in society and under the law and in all sorts of other important ways that would be treated anything like me offering my secretary a raise for a blowjob. Yeah, I agree. So I think there's two things going on that I think this analogy is conflating. And one is like like exploitation of power. Mm-hmm. Um, and But the other is like, it is clear that like a lot of people have a lot of loaded feelings around blowjobs. If you were like, hey, I have a job description in which I want you to assist me. And also part of the job is give me blowjobs. And somebody signed up for that. People might be horrified, but I think that we should allow this as a society. Like two consenting adults deciding that they are want to voluntarily enter right, the let's agreement. Start writing the job description. <laughs> yeah, let's get the no. job advert out right now. I just, just realised I robbed my hands. That looks dreadful. <laughs> that looks dreadful, and we probably need to cut it. This has not been my. No, no, this out. is going in. This is going in. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that we're not acknowledging here, Ayla, and I think we need to, is there's the a power- fly on your head. Yeah, That's there's a fly on Mate, my head. This looks like an episode filmed in Africa. I have yeah, to say. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what's happened with the flies. Anyway, anyway, so the, the question that I want to ask is this. Why I am literally surrounded by flies. I've got one and I've killed one. We can cut that. You're, you're Barack Obama. Do you remember when he killed the fly? Really? Yeah, everyone thought he was a real man. Yeah, the there you go. <laughs> they did. He, he killed the fly and was like, get that, show it on camera. Yeah, show that I'm a man in charge of my own destiny. I can kill an insect. Obviously, all the Buddhists have switched off now. But what we're not acknowledging here, Ayla, is the power dynamic. Mm-hmm. Well, that, she did, yeah, she did acknowledge it. But, but, uh, but I don't think that we, we, we really delved into it. Do you see what I mean? Like, there is a very, very real power dynamic, and we've seen it again and again. And we use the example of PAs, but there's other industries, particularly the performing arts industries, for instance, where this has been in existence for decades, if not centuries, and it's deeply exploitative. Uh, yeah, I generally don't... Like I find the word exploitative to be like a little bit confused and loaded, but I agree that like sex is a very loaded thing that a lot of men want, and a lot of women are like, "Girl, don't have it with me." Um, yeah, and so, if you introduce yeah. this thing with like really intense incentives into anything, it's going to like warp things around it. People are going to be like, "Oh, maybe if I have sex with my boss, he'll give me a raise," or mm-hmm. you know, the boss will be like, "Oh, maybe she'll have sex with me to get a raise." I agree that this is like a thing that warps incentives. Okay. That's your question. Listen, I've got a, a way of uh, adding to the example we were working with earlier that might be helpful. Let's say I go to my secretary and I say to her, "Your job description currently is to make coffee, to run my diary, to book appointments, blah 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 blah." However, you currently get paid, let's say, $50,000 uh, $50, a year, let's say, right? I'm going to double your salary if we modify your job description to include the following sex acts. Mm-hmm. You think that's a perfectly reasonable thing of, of an employer to offer a, an employee? Uh, I, th- I think it should be allowed, yeah. Like, because she can say no, right? She can, but... I imagine most people's reaction to that sort of proposal would be one of intense horror. Oh. I don't have that horror reaction. I can tell. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that's really interesting that, that you don't have that reaction because also as well, the woman tends to, sex for a woman is far more fraught than sex for a man. You t you can lose a lot more. You have more risk of great, of uh, c catching an STD. You know, there's a potential for pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a reputational damage as well. Mm -hmm. So. You would say take away the reputational damage, I'm guessing, right? I, I would say what? Take oh, away the... For most people, there is reputational damage. Yeah. Though. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Because, yeah. you know, if somebody does that, and they, you know, it's you know, and you your argument is, look, these are two consenting adults, and they come to this agreement. Who are we to make a comment? Well, we all know that society, and by society, I mean women, don't really see it like that because there will be a lot of women who will. There'll actually, be a lot of men who don't. Yeah, like a lot of either. men as well who will just say, look, this is disgusting and an abhorrent. This person is a is a you know, and they will say all these awful things. Uh, yeah, that's true. There's a lot of it's very intense stigma against sex work, but I think it's interesting. So, for example, seeking arrangement is this. You, are you familiar with this website? It's a website where it's not escorting and it's not quite dating. It's like you can be a sugar daddy and like so. It's typically for wealthier men to find poor women and then you take them out to dinner and you buy them gifts in exchange for an arrangement, typically involving sex. Um, and this is not prostitution because it's like dating. This happens all the time. <laughs> normal... that, 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 that doesn't wash for me. <laughs> But like normal dating, a lot of normal dating culture abides by these rules unspoken. Like girls want a rich man. These rich rich man fantasies are like everywhere. The Fifty Shades of Grey is a billionaire. Like Twilight, he's a super like wealthy old person or something. Um, but I'm saying that like in general, the ancient exchange is like a man provides financial stability mm. for a woman and she provides him a child or by proxy sex. Yeah. Um, and I'm saying to some extent this is always taking place. And the more you obfuscate it, the more you're saying, oh, I'm not exchanging sex for money, I'm exchanging money for some other things, um, like financial support. It's very trad. I'm saying very trad things. This is not <laughs> crazy. Um, then people are much more willing to abide by it. And what's interesting is that the seeking arrangement prices are much lower than the escort prices. Like if you're a seeking arrangement girl, you can charge maybe 50% if, if you were being an escort. Um, and this, I think we can see is the premium on explicitness. Mm. So if you're a girl doing this thing normally, but you say explicitly, I'm going to just have sex, you get to charge a lot more because fewer women are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think like the question is not, um, are women willing to exchange sex for value, but rather the horror is at explicitly saying that they're doing that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that is a very trad thing to say in many yeah. ways. And many a comedian has, has done a bit on this, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but moving on, I, I'm curious, you also do a lot of research with the stuff that mm -hmm. you do. Uh, and I was curious if you had any insight. I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey was <laughs> like by far and away the best book, uh, the best selling, but right? not the best. I'm not personally <laughs> endorsing it. Uh, good Freudian <laughs> slip there. Uh, We've covered ourselves in glory yeah, on this, this one, mate. In this interview, we look even worse than the Theo Von interview. Yeah. Anyway. Um, what I was going to say is it was immensely popular and it feels to me like within that there's some kind of social taboo about naming whatever that power dynamic tends to be between men and women. What is your insight into why that book was and movie was so popular and what sort of is behind all of that? I mean, it's just porn for women. Like, this is... No, but isn't the narrative is, though, that... Uh, Evil pornography has created the demand in men for rough sex, <laughs> which is horrific to women. And this is kind of like male exploitation. You laughed when I said that. Why did you laugh? It's, it's just like there's a lot of things I can agree debates about. Oh, is sex, sex work, you know, bad or good for society yeah. at large? I'm like, this is like a reasonable thing to inquire. But like when it comes to the porn thing, it's just one of the things that I find to be so lacking any evidence. Uh, the evidence is all to the opposite, and there's quite a bit of it. Like, my research and a lot of established research is so that women have way more interest in, like, violent rough power dynamics than men do. Significant, like, it's just clear. It's, like, one of the most established things, which is why I'm, like, I don't understand why this narrative is so popular. Spe so, Ella, sorry to interrupt. I really want to hear the rest of it. But just to spell it out, and what you're saying is the evidence is, in your opinion, that... Uh, women are more interested in rough sex yep. than men? Very much. 
I, I did one survey. Um, it was both of my own audience and also paid random sample um, of people asking to predict what do you think the other person would like in bed. And then for men to predict to women, what do you think the woman would like in bed? And I listed a whole bunch of things. And then I asked women, um, assuming that the guy is well-intentioned, like he actually thinks they're going to like it, assuming he's safe, whatever, um, what things would you respond well to if he tried them in bed? Um, and so we get to see like a list of like what guys think ladies like and what girls say they actually want. Um, and, but then I, I checked it by how much porn do you want? And the more porn a man watched, the more accurate he was at guessing what women wanted in bed. And the big difference, the biggest difference was choking between what women reported they wanted to happen and what men thought that women would be okay with. This is just like one small study. There's like a whole bunch more. And the evolutionary rationale for this, I'm guessing, would be that a lot of women have DNA that, uh, I mean, a lot of women historically were in situations where it was advantageous to be turned on by somebody who was strong and powerful and quite often actually a rapist, right? Yeah, like, I mean, if you look at, like, chimps, for example, their whole sexual world is full of violence and, like, aggression and mate guarding and, like, the males making sure the females aren't don't go off alone with another man and, like, threatening them. Uh, so it seems, like, pretty possible that we have something like this in our own history. Um, but there's other questions, like, it's possible that it's a falling testosterone thing because mm. there's some evidence to suggest that testosterone is correlated with sexual dominance. And if everybody's... Um, testosterone is dropping, then we would see women more submissive and men less interested in dominance is a possibility. Wow. Um, there's also a thing where as a female, like maybe in history, if you reproduce with like a very aggressive man, your sons are going to be more likely to reproduce. Yeah. Like you're going to give birth to like, like more like, <laughs> I'll say rapey, but like more like, you know, dominant, more like kind of aggressive kind of yeah. males, which yeah. are going to have greater reproductive success. Yeah. So it's, the history is not always flattering, but... So you're doing your sex research, which is very interesting. So, I mean, the billion dollar question is, what is it that women want from men on the whole? What is it that they want from a partner? What is it that they want on average from a sexual partner? I mean, it depends a lot. It depends a lot on the woman. Like a lot of women are submissive, but this is like roughly 60%. And it depends on how you define submissive. There's like different Wait, but roughly 60%. So that, that's like barely more than half. So we have a whole 40% that aren't interested in that at all. Um, so it, like to say like one generalization is going to be quite hard. Yeah. But I think generally competence is pretty valued. Um, mm -hmm. Competence and, and attentiveness and power. Like if you can establish yourself as a sexually desirable mate, like a lot of other women want you. Um, but that basically if you could just be a romance novel protagonist, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of other ladies want you. Um, and but you are kind of non-reactive to women. Um, what does that mean, non-reactive? Uh, sort of like you, in the same way that like being an attractive woman is being very reactive to the man. Like he mm. wants to to know that he has like the ability to like change your mental state in like positive make or negative you laugh, ways. Yeah. Et cetera, right? Make you yeah, like you tease you and you're like have a strong response. Yeah. Um, and this indicates like vulnerability and I don't know, like pliableness. But like what women want is basically the reverse. You want like a man who is not like super reactive to you. He wants to be like steady and strong and sort of stoic in a way. It'd be very common. Really? And normally women always say sense of humor. Is that a thing or is that just a myth? I know, so that's a thing. Really? <laughs> so, d just demonstrating like competence and intelligence. Yeah, but the, the thing I would suggest with humor is humor frequently is a coping mechanism. It's a coping mechanism and it's normally, you look at every stand-up comedian that I've ever met, they're all ADHD'd out of their brain, including me. So I, like, how does that work, you know? Are you, are you, do you use it as a coping mechanism? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I see. Yeah. I wonder if there's a difference between comedians and normal people though. Who are just funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is. Yeah. yeah, comedians are fucking mental. Yeah. That's the difference. Dude, I know one of the like, most emotionally traumatized clients I ever had was a comedian. I'm pausing for an extra time waiting, <laughs> wait, waiting for you to say his name, but I didn't yeah, expect no, it to come. No. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so... That, that would get a lot more clicks though, Ellie, yeah. you know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do a little poll to see yeah. who we think it is. Yeah. Um, um, but so... so so let, let's look at it on, in terms of a kind of almost like a league table, as it were and unscientific as that term is. So what is the thing that women desire the most on average? Is it the stoicness? Is it the dependability? Is it the competence? Is it? 
<laughs> this is like asking like what is the most central feature to being a woman yeah and it's like well, well, well we can name some woman, things yeah. but like yeah uh it's a really fraught topic yeah uh i, th- I think like generally power is pretty close and that yeah. can manifest in a lot of different ways mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, and for for very good evolutionary reasons. Mm-hmm. Ella, in terms of your research, what I, I'd love to know is what do you think are some of the most misunderstood, and also just like we don't talk about the truth about sex dynamics, men and women. Like, what are the things that people pretend that are true that are not true, pretend aren't true that are true? Do you just see what I'm, what I'm getting? In at? Se- oh, uh, probably the origin of fetishes. Oh, tell okay. us about that. Well, so, uh, well, fetishes in general. Like, we don't have good research at all about how sexuality works. I mean, we know a couple of clues here and there. Like, maybe hormones cause being gay or something. But beyond that, we just don't have a clue. And the contrast of how much we know versus the amount of very intense cultural uh, supposed knowledge, like, you'll have people very confidently making claims about, uh, like, oh, well, you know, you're into like sexual, like rape play because you're abused as a child, which t- technically is correct, but you don't know that. Um, it, there's just a, a lot of like, oh, you know, you're into f- foot fetishes because you were exposed to feet as a kid. Um, Weren't we all? Exactly. Expo- <laughs> exposed to feet. I, I mean, I saw like, quite a lot of feet. I don't have a foot <laughs> fetish. But also as well, w- what is a fetish? Because in, in this incredibly polarized time, you know, if a guy, for instance, likes and is sex- more sexually attracted to, I don't know, Asian women, that is seen as a fetish or is that a sexual preference? Yeah, I don't think like these words are like we can use words to refer to things, but there's no hard line. Mm-hmm. And I think in general, like when people are like researching fetishes and paraphilias, I don't think those terminologies are very useful. All we have is just sexual interests, and some are more common than others. We have a spectrum, and we have a spectrum of like how taboo are, is your sexual interest. And we can like use a word to refer to like well, kind of the fetishes at this far end are maybe more fetishy or something. I saw a great meme about that, which is like, it's three normal boxes, like guys who like boobs, guy who likes butts, guy who likes something else, and then feet, and there's like this guy. <laughs> I think I just that see that. Yeah. Fucking brilliant. Yeah. So how, how, how do fetishes develop? You, you were saying earlier. We don't know. Uh, don't know. My This is one of the things I'm trying to find in my research, and it's like a weird amount of stuff doesn't correlate that you would think do correlate. Like, for example, being spanked in childhood does correlate with interest in spanking in adulthood, but only barely. Like, it wouldn't really, you wouldn't be able to predict it very much. Um, And this is, like, really counter to a lot of narratives about how, like, spanking fetishes develop, for example. It's it's, it's really weird. Yeah. Although, there, one of the strange, I need to look at the, I have a lot of data that I'm, like, slowly working through, so I've kind of done some glancing. So let's take it with a grain of salt. But it seems that um, there's an unusual relationship in childhood and fetishes for trans men specifically, but not trans women or uh, straight or cis people. Like, as in things in childhood correlate a lot more with fetishes in adulthood, but that, only for that category. That's really interesting. And why is it that, a foot fetish is a pretty mainstream thing, yet it has such a strong... Like, if I knew someone had a foot fetish, I'll be honest with you, I'd be, I'd think they were a little bit weird. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, foot fetishes are actually relatively uncommon, given how aware we are of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, but it's... They've got great PIs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, like, there's a... And we don't know, this is a rumor, you know, Tarantino has a foot fetish. And then you look at every single one of his movies, yeah. And, there, and then there is like, you know, there's the toe sucking or whatever it may be in, in his movies. And you go, I, I kind of, and maybe this is me being prim and proper, like there's a slight judgmental air to it. Do you know what I mean? Do you feel the same about like gay people, for example? Which no, is, oh. no, but okay. I just think foot fetishes are what wrong. What about like fuzzy handcuffs? Sorry? What about fuzzy, fuzzy handcuffs? handcuffs? Like somebody's like, I really want to be in fuzzy handcuffs. No. Okay. I'm just like trying to find like where the line yeah. is. What about Keep going. pee? I'm Somebody wants it. to pee on on you. That's Sorry? fucking weird. <laughs> okay, okay, that's too. That's hard. weird. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't. What else? Somebody who's really into like braids. They really braids. If a girl puts her hair in braids, they're just like, that's really hot. That, that, that's, is that a sex fetish? That's just a hairstyle. Anything surely. is a fetish. Well, look, no. I kind of get like if you're having sex and you pull the braids. Do you know what I mean? Like, do, do you, you see what you can pull? Uh, look, this is this conversation is <laughs> going the wrong way fast because I was about to say you can pull hair too. Yeah. Anyway, but, no, braids is not weird. No, peeing weird, 
Feet, feet weird. weird. Okay. Feet, right. feet weird. Feet, feet weird. Feet, feet, it's just weird. <laughs> and like, you ask me and like, you, but you go, right, let's look at this logically. Right, do you like boobs? Yes. Do you like bums? Yes. So what's the difference? There, there is nothing. There is no difference. Between like bums and feet? But, well, it's just a part of the human body. You, you, you're attracted to a part of the human body. Some people are attracted to that part of the human body. So is the toenail. Yeah. It doesn't mean toenail fetishes are normal. It's fucking weird. And by, by weird, you mean abnormal, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fet, like, most fetishes are pretty abnormal. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't think I'd trust someone if they had a foot fetish. No. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. You should be able to you ask that on an employee survey. You probably know a lot of friends who have a foot fetish. Say again? You probably know many people, many of your friends probably have a foot fetish, but have not told you. Well, if you are, you're no longer our friend. Yeah, unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Mate, imagine we come back to the channel, it's like halved. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out we just attracted a legion of foot fetishes. <laughs> Well, oh. Ella, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for letting us sort of prod and find stuff out. It's been really, uh, really cool to chat with you. I feel like my virginity has grown back at times, so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, my but it's, it's been really yeah. fun. Um, the question we, last question we always ask is, uh, what's before we go to our locals where we ask you questions from our audience, and if there's any foot fetish people, you're getting deleted. Um, <laughs> Unless you're a top level patron, in which case, welcome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Will uh, you be France... posting photos of your feet for your patrons? We should do that, shouldn't we? Do you know what? You know what? Imagine we could make way more money than we do now, just selling pictures of our feet. Imagine I mean, that. we're not women, so it wouldn't happen. But no, you know it wouldn't. What I mean. Imagine that. Imagine if like Rogan contacted us like next year, he's like, "Hey lads, you want to come back on the pod?" Turns out, mate, we're making way more money selling pictures of feet. Feetonometry. Yeah. Anyway, Ella, before we go to locals, where we'll ask you questions from our audience, uh, the last question we always finish with is uh, an opportunity for you to basically say whatever you think, which is, what's the one thing that we're not talking about as a society that you think we really should be? Uh, I'm trying to think of what we already covered. Maybe like a modification on some things I've said. Uh, uh, from my perspective, having been in sex work for 10 years, in the last, I would say, two to f four years, there's been... Um, a change on the internet, like a prudish chilling effect. Uh, there's been a backlash basically against sexuality that's starting to shut down what is allowed to be posted where, um, that, that I find to be quite tragic as a lover of sexuality. Um, and this is, I haven't seen people talking about this. Like the, the so neo So tell us more then, because what are you talking about specifically? Uh, just like you, the things that are allowed on the internet just aren't anymore. Like on OnlyFans, you can't do bondage material. Um, you used to be able to, like, they've taken down a whole bunch of fetish options from websites. Um, a whole bunch of sex subreddits got banned from Reddit, like, a couple of years ago. Um, anything that's, like, abnormal. The sex subreddits, by the way, the niche ones, got also banned with, like, a lot of things dedicated to trans discourse um, on both mm -hmm. sides. So whatever sort of uh, prudish effect is coming is still in, like, oh, anything that's, like, too edgy or too inappropriate might make people feel offended. Um, these are just getting whitewashed off the internet. Like DuckDuckGo, for example, used to yeah. be the go-to porn engine. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be the uncensored one. You can't search porn on there anymore. It's non-porn. Um, so basically like sexuality, especially niche sexuality, and especially like edgy ones that most people like are a little offended by, um, are like slowly getting censored off of everywhere and nobody cares because it's porn. Like with like trans discourse, people fight about it and then we have a whole culture war. Uh, but nobody's willing to stand up publicly for like the weird niche sex stuff, and I find that really tragic. Actually, I was going to ask you about trans, but we'll ask you uh, yeah. about that in the local section. So thank you so much for coming on. Head on over to Locals where we continue the conversation. What do you make of the whole trans conversation? 